uh, thank you very much. Uh, so that's, that's what you get when you Google something. Uh, complete exaggeration um, and uh, half-truths, I think. Uh, I, I'm actually much more humble than that. Uh, I, uh, I do have certain sort of opinions about uh, what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, and I think, you know, I've reached a stage in life where I believe it's very important that somebody says it. Uh, I haven't heard anybody else say it, so I decided that it was time that I actually say it. Uh, so, um, initially, I'd like to say it's really a great honor to be here today. Uh, and before I begin, I'd like to uh, thank Jerry, uh, Jerry Wen, for his immense generosity and strength. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to Jerry for having invited me to speak. Uh, he spent an afternoon a few months ago uh, discussing the Arab world with me, and I must have said something interesting to him uh, because he invited me to Wharton. Uh, I got very excited. Um, I, uh, I'm actually uh, off, off from my job without permission uh, to speak to you today. Um, so I'd also like to thank all the people who've uh, helped organize the event. I know the immense efforts that go on behind the scenes. Uh, I also just come from watching uh, John Kerry on TV speaking about uh, the challenge that ISIS uh, uh, in particular presents, um, not just to the Arab world, but to the Islamic world and to, uh, to, well, to the US. Uh, and I am even more convinced now that he's only got part of the picture um, and that there are, there are sort of greater forces at play. Uh, and that this isn't simply a military matter. So world foreign ministers just met in Paris to, defeat, uh, to decide how to defeat the movement called ISIS. Uh, uh, ISIS is, in my opinion, above all an ideological movement which gains its strength by winning recruits and sympathizers across the Arab world. Uh, so how can ISIS be defeated ideologically? Uh, so I, I'm assuming that most people in the room want to defeat ISIS in one way or another. Um, uh, I, I apologize if that's not the common, the common opinion. Uh, so as, as a UAE ambassador to Moscow, uh, I've been there for six years. Uh, I, want to, I want to say that I also think of myself as slightly uh, um, outside of the, the narrow box of a, a diplomat. So I think of myself as a liberal uh, in the positive and broader sense of the word. Uh, secondly, I think of myself as an Arab who insists on thinking as deeply as possible about the Arab world and its future. And uh, thirdly, uh, I think of myself uh, as an individual uh, with uh, a right to uh, an opinion uh, and a right to uh, an existence uh, that I define. So um, as a liberal, a conscientious thinker, and an individual, uh, that's how I would like you to hear me, not necessarily as a, as a government official pushing a specific government line. So I think I'm going to spend about half an hour uh, speaking, and then I look forward to questions and answers. So why am I speaking about this topic today, and why do I intend to, uh, to speak about it uh, in other places? Well, it's because I, I and many others like me are horrified by the violence shown by ISIS in the name of Islam and in the name of the Arabs. ISIS has slaughtered its critics, including many among the Sunni Arab community, which it claims to defend. It strangely and arrogantly, I believe, claims the right to rule over all Muslims everywhere in the world. Uh, it shows ambition at, uh, at a minimum. It's persecuted minorities, which every decent Muslim individual should cherish and protect. And it's not unique in that respect, unfortunately, because other Islamist movements uh, have done much the same. Uh, and indeed, one of the points that I'm, I want to make is that other Islamist movements, including, uh, in my view, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, also need to be confronted. So most of the coverage of the reaction to ISIS has been of the West and its Arab allies marshalling a coalition to defeat uh, militarily ISIS and eradicate it from the territories it claims. Uh, and this is said to take anywhere between three and, and, and 10 years. But ISIS is much more dangerous as a model in the minds of my fellow uh, Arabs and fellow Muslims. It's the shell into which any substance can be inserted. And it is, it is this aspect of ISIS that I believe must be fought above all. So I've got uh, five proposals or ideas for how one might go about doing this in, in a positive sense, in the sense of not just um, uh, eradicating really bad people and really bad ideas, but coming up with something to then replace those uh, very attractive uh, ideas. So I'm not focusing on the measures that need to be taken to stop individuals from funding ISIS, and I'm not going to set out economic or political measures, such as concessions to Iraq Sunni Arab minority or policies to reduce unemployment. It's not because I don't think these are all uh, important. I just think there are others who can discuss them uh, better uh, and who have uh, more sort of uh, the statistical knowledge that perhaps I, I have. So I, I prefer to talk about the ideological debate within the Arab world uh, and some of also the things that are not said that should be part of the ideological debate uh, and how all of this can be turned against ISIS and other Islamists. 
So this is a debate primarily to be had between Arabs, uh, and it should be done in terms that Arabs understand. Worrying whether a Western society or media will like what we say to each other distracts us from speaking to each other. When we talk of moderate Islamists or Islamic democracy, it's often clear that we're not actually talking to each other in the Arab world. We're talking to an imagined Washington and what we expect Washington then to tell us. Uh, these are not coherent concepts, at least not yet. And they're not, I don't believe, very high up on the real list of priorities. Uh, so as a Sunni Muslim, uh, as distinct from a Sunni Islamist, what are my concerns? I and many of my compatriots are deeply concerned about, number one, our moral state. Number two, the violence within our Arab Muslim society. Number three, our theological leadership. Number four, the role of laymen and people of goodwill in redirecting the path of the Arab and Muslim worlds. And number five, the jobs and economy, of course. So these five themes, morality, tolerance, religious moderation, inclusivity, and good government, or what I will call technology, are critical ones for undermining the appeal of militant Islamist movements like ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood. So in my view, we should first point out that although they say they will make Muslims more virtuous, they do not. Their prospectus of forced morality and imposed religious norms is not just illogical, it's also bound to fail. Second, we should highlight that their program of violence and intolerance is in contrast to the historical caliphate. It is actually a reductive sketch of Islamic history. Third, we should tackle the issues of the Muslim clergy, who either back the extremists and license their violence, or do not interest themselves uh, in, the pastoral duties, in their pastoral duties to Muslims in and of the 21st century. Fourth, we must tackle the question of how our societies should be guided, what the right path is to a better future, with inclusive government and security for all citizens. And lastly, I believe we must show that Islamists govern badly. They govern badly not just because of their inexperience, but because their ideology actually prevents them from governing well. So let me look first at morality. Islamists are fond of saying that Islam is the answer. I, I grew up, uh, and this was something that I always took for granted, that it is the answer. This is a motto that was promulgated by the Muslim Brotherhood, but also by Shia militant movements in Iraq. In the last few years, many of uh, us have actually asked, what was the question? Islam is the answer, what was the question? Islam is our religion, uh, and it is a deep and powerful influence over our lives. And for many of us, it is the answer to our spiritual and existential needs. However, when it's reified by Islamists and used as a promotional tool for what I can only say is a lust for power, then I believe that we need to push back until we get more answers at least. So one way of pushing back is by asking why Islam is the answer to specific questions, and why specifically is it the answer in their hands? Well, the Islamist explanation never moves beyond vague assurances that all will, we, all will be good when we implement Islam. But that still doesn't answer the question why a purely technical or administrative or biological or societal problem will be solved through piety. In fact, it seems that utilizing our religion in this way is a disservice to it. The focus of our religion, in my view, and the view of many of my fellow Muslims, is ethical, moral, and spiritual in its essence. Deciding pension fund politics is not the realm of religion, nor is economic development directly the realm of religion. There will, of course, be ethical matters to take into account, principles of fairness, equity, and, and, and justice. But it is too much to say that there is a specifically Islamic answer to these matters. The truth is that there are many answers to these questions, depending on how we describe them. I often find it interesting that corruption is cited as one of the vices that will be stopped by implementing Islam under the Islamists. We are told that pious people will hold positions of responsibility and that this will bring corruption to a halt. This is wishful thinking at best. Why not try some tried and tested administrative procedures that will ensure enough transparency to make corruption much more difficult to hide? My worry is that we are asking too little of our great religion. When our holy text and our moral principles can be directed towards personal regeneration, we instead demand of it to convert the publicly pious into the morally infallible, a very difficult task. We can, move, uh, we can more easily and quickly build administrative systems uh, that will perform this function without regard to the moral worth of the administrator and be of greater uh, service to our fellow citizens. What is also worrying is to see religion's noble goals being used to justify evil and cowardly means. It is used, for example, to glorify violence, which is something that ISIS's uh, religious propaganda does all the time. 
And it can be used to cover up another kind of violence, the violence of bribery, corruption, and exploitation. It is also a kind of psychological violence that we do to each other whenever, when, when we enforce religious standards on each other to the point where we monitor each other's mental states, searching eagerly for moral weakness. The second message I'd like to talk about is about tolerance uh, as opposed to violence. Essentially, that ISIS and other movements are reading history incorrectly and selectively when they claim to be the modern successors of the early Muslims. There's no doubting the power of the claim that they make. Let me focus on ISIS for a moment, although both ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood are Islamist movements, and fundamentally, I believe, hostile to the kind of Arab society that I want to see. Uh, ISIS, I think, is more worrying for me than the Muslim Brotherhood. Why? The Muslim Brotherhood is, more, uh, is a more cult-like organization, in my view, a fraternity of sorts, with all sorts of tests and demonstrations of absolute loyalty to a religious administrative leadership. It's a closed system that is mired in its own myth-making and worldview. ISIS, on the other hand, is an open system. Uh, it's violent and makes an appeal to the basic elements of Islamic history. ISIS intends, or seems to intend, to replicate the spread of Islam by the sword throughout the region in a kind of replay of 7th century history. It is actually a very seductive approach that makes use of many commonly held references. It claims the forms of ancient Islamic history for itself in a way that many uh, Muslims recognize, including myself. The Muslim Brotherhood, on the other hand, is a modern hierarchy that is not reflected in, a, in the early history of Islam. ISIS recalls the caliphs and the battles where so many early Muslims proved themselves or sacrificed themselves to, to defeat the enemies of Islam. It appeals to this sense of reenactment, and this is where its true danger lies. ISIS have managed to articulate and reference a misleading and one-dimensional narrative uh, that unfortunately has wide purchase in our region. I don't think this point actually comes out very often. Uh, it's, it's described as a complete distortion of Islam. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a, a bit worrying. Uh, many of us will recognize elements within that that actually aren't a distortion, uh, but a, 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 a very strange expression of uh, Islam. So why does it have this uh, wide purchase? Well, I believe because of institutional pressure that refuses to examine and re-examine the implications of poorly understood beliefs that we have about our religion, about our history, about present societies, and the ways in which we can improve our lives. Here, we Sunni Muslims need to ask ourselves some critical questions. Why would the form of an Islamic state and the declaration of a caliphate so excite certain populations on social media? Do, do these people know what they are excited about? Do they understand the difference between the form of an announced caliphate and the substance of daily murder in the name of our dear religion? Do they realize that ISIS would likely behead them if they were under its rule? Do they know enough history to realize that in the time of the actual caliphate, the, the, the Caliph Yazid was, sent to, uh, was spe said to spend his evenings in long and friendly discussions with his Christian minister, who later became a Christian saint? Or that the Caliph al-Mansur sought advice from Hindu astronomers before choosing the time to lay the foundation stone of Baghdad? So basically, tolerance. ISIS's so-called Islamic state is a perversion of history, but it is not a completely alien proposition. The set of actions it's taken and the set of references they make are very well known, I believe, in the Arab world. And that makes it particularly dangerous. This is where our religious authorities need to step up and devise narratives that attract a new generation of young Arab Muslims. And, to be honest, Muslims from, uh, from Western Europe, where they seem to have a, a lot of excitement uh, for ISIS. So let me turn now to the question of those religious authorities, how they behave and how they are constituted. My third theme is religious moderation. And for this to flourish, I believe we've got to address the issue of the Islamic clergy. I believe in free speech, uh, and I'm exercising it here. Yet there are limits to it. Religious leaders who claim, in effect, to speak for God have great power to sway people's minds, especially the minds of those who have not been taught to think for themselves. It's unconscionable and unacceptable, in my opinion, that a cleric with, the authority is, uh, uh, with such authority as Yusuf al-Qaradawi, who lives in Qatar and who has great influence with the Muslim Brotherhood, and who I used to watch on, on uh, Al Jazeera and, and enjoy very much, uh, it's unconscionable that he can be allowed to say, as he did in 2009, that Hitler put the Jews in their place and then the next time will be at the hands of the believers. In the context of Syria, though obviously the Assad regime has done many terrible things to the Syrian people, those clerics who have encouraged viciously violent Islamist groups like ISIS have done a great disservice to the Arab world and to humanity. 
But it has occurred to me that perhaps militant clerics give license to these groups because of their own insecurity. Perhaps in turn, this insecurity is a result of their, their apparent inability to engage with questions thrown up by modernity, telecommunications, and globalization. One of the key problems of the Muslim Brotherhood and ISIS narratives is that they are one-dimensional, disconnected, reductive sketches of Islam's history and that of the modern world. However, this is perhaps precisely why they appeal to ex existentially disenfranchised young Muslims. If our traditional religious authorities are unable to recognize that their grasp of Islam's narrative in the minds of our youth is slipping, then it is for laymen and people of goodwill to take up the baton. Today, we need to think in terms of Islamic structures and institutions that are more responsive to people's existential needs and of how they can be of service to the people rather than how the people can be of service to their visions of glory. We need religious leaders who show a concern for the well-being of each and every individual in their community. We need a religious leadership that thinks about the modern world, that understands political science and economics, that's well-read in the social sciences, that speaks languages and that looks at young Muslims, Arabs, Arab or not, as individuals to be educated and cared for, not as cannon fodder in an Islamist onslaught against modernity. My fourth theme is inclusivity. I don't see democracy as the answer to the Islamists, and I would rather focus on inclusion instead. Here's why. When I saw the protests in Tahrir Square in, in Cairo in 2011, and protests against Ben Ali in Tunisia, and, uprising, and the uprising against Gaddafi in Libya, I and many of my friends wanted to believe, as the Western press did, that these protests were an expression of the noble aspirations of the Arab people, a flowering of the demand for freedom and democracy by the oppressed of the region, and the end of, the, of Arab exclusion from history. Now in 2014, we see that Tunisia is unsettled and the question of Islamist control uh, of government is still undecided. Libya is in great trouble uh, with the proliferation of arms and militias threatening the unity of the state. Egypt experienced its non-coup and is at the heart of the battle between an ideological Islamist worldview and a worldview that I would say is more inclusive in scope, perhaps because I've got a, some inside information. Uh, I'm not sure if it's coming out in the press in the same manner. Yemen doesn't make the headlines these days, but the economy is suffering tremendously, and various low-level conflicts continue to tear at the fabric of the country. Of course, Syria is the shame of the Arab world, with over 200,000 dead now, and a merciless and brutal civil war that has morphed into the specter of radical and violent religious extremists dominating more and more territory. So what's gone wrong? First, despite the virtues of democracy, it can be divisive, much more so when it is coupled with Islamism. It can be a puzzle to people new to democracy to understand that winning the election doesn't mean that the minority has no further role to play and no rights re that remain. Many Islamists will welcome democratic elections on the basis that we are all Muslim societies and that therefore the most Muslim of parties will win and win and win again. Whereas in my view, the point of designing political systems is that they, are, they be genuinely just and stable and this will involve the expression of wider and deeper principles, such as the protection of all, winners and losers, majorities and minorities, men and women, so that the chance of renewal always remains a possibility, and so that people can still live in peace and security, irrespective of their personal and uh, religious beliefs. Islamist election winners in Egypt and Iraq were not willing to make any such concession. Yet in our society, which is still divided along regional, tribal, ethnic and religious lines, there are many minorities. Faced with the threat of suffering from arbitrary power, many are willing to fight when confronted with the prospect of democracy, strangely, as they would fight any change that may threaten their freedom. It's no coincidence that ISIS was born in Iraq, which is an electoral democracy of just this kind, one which is run by Shia Islamists. Those who benefit from dividing the country on religious lines and can then appeal to their home base for votes have no interest in treating citizens on an equal basis regardless of their religion. It's partly because of Islamist movements, I believe, that democracy in the Arab world will be so difficult to implement. It's also because of the lack of institutions that can rise above partisan politics. When every, when every minister who is elected in a country like Iraq evicts the existing staff and replaces them with his or her own partisans, the stakes in an election are raised very high. Given the social, cultural, and educational realities of our part of the world, many of us recognize that an introduction of ele electoral democracy that precedes the development of effective and partial institutions may exacerbate tribal and sectarian divisions. Even when voting, uh, even the voting in something as apparently inno uh, innocuous 
as a regional poetry competition in the Emirates, often takes place along uh, tribal lines. This doesn't mean that Western style democratic processes will never uh, take root or, or will never happen. Simply that overnight changes in the civil relationships, in civil relationships are fraught with dangers. On the other hand, the, the Islamists demand that we all obey the utterances of a shadow, shadowy spiritual guide and his business savvy henchman. Islam is the answer to all questions. And the conveyor of those answer, answers is a person whose infallibility never seems to be in doubt. What happens when such a movement is elected? How can it ever be expected to yield up power, peace, power peacefully? When is the last time that any movement which saw itself as having a God-given right to rule stood, stood down in, a, in favor of a, an allegedly godless opposition? So the challenge is to find a way to include all citizens and give them a voice without risking the ripping apart of the social fabric as we've seen happen in a number of Arab countries so far. The fifth and last theme that I want to address is the issue of, of good government, how to deliver jobs and security. Let me address this first through the, uh, the lens of technology. The Arab and Islamic world has an illustrious history with technology. The Muslim world produced some remarkable technological achievements in the areas of mathematics, astronomy, geography, and medicine. Modern day Islamist movements are not as open-minded. They want to accept the technological product, but refuse the premises upon which the technology came into existence. We are always in search of a pure and idealized past where ethics, morality, and the path to the good life were clearly set out and where the right cho choices were always clear. Introducing an environment that would allow us to flourish technologically means that we would have to open the doors to inquiry, and the best inquiry is free inquiry. Given that our current theological masters are not ready yet to face the puzzling questions of science and modernity, they prefer to dictate against the inquiry, but to accept the product of the inquiry. And thus we have the injunction against innovation, invention, importation of foreign and alien ideas. What's the, what is the area of application of this injunction? Who decides its limits? The reality is that this injunction may be in, uh, of limited scope in theory. However, the way it is taken up by various groups in the Muslim world is less selective. This is a point I'd like to emphasize as it's critical for the future of the Arab world. Technology is the product of inquiry and is premised on the creation of a free space of inquiry. Without the freedom to inquire, to question, to challenge, we have no ability to create. However, inquiry cannot be limited to those areas permitted by religious authority. Inquiry quickly, quickly escapes its master's grip, just as radicalism does. This inquiry is limited more by religious injunction and ideologists of religion than political censorship. So does this attempt to limit our interaction with the immoral world of inquiry mean that we will be saved from evil? I don't believe so. In fact, we are doubly disadvantaged. Firstly, it puts us in a place where we will find our lives produced and manipulated by other people's designs of technology. And I don't think that's something that we're, we're aware of in, in the Middle East. Uh, not having produced technology, we, don't, we can't directly see the effects of technology. And secondly, we lack the ability to create it ourselves. We want the project, uh, product, but we reject the principles that led to the creation of the product. Uh, I was shocked a, a, a few years ago to hear that the spir uh, spiritual guide of the Muslim Brotherhood, again, Yusuf al-Qaradawi, said that God had produced the West to provide Muslims with technology, and thus there was no need for us to create it ourselves at the very least an incoherent approach uh, and an unambitious approach. Uh, it seems that when it is a Western invention, we do not have the moral burden of the consequences of the product. We're merely its weak and weakened object. What does make sense is that this approach will increase the tension in the Arab and Muslim worlds between those who insist on going backwards in time and those who are in the present time. This tension is reflected in the battle between radicalism and progressive thinking and between those who want to stop still, who want time to stop still, and those who recognize that life is about mastering change on a daily basis. This is not a moral issue, it's simply the logic of contrasting existences and, and worldviews. Uh, as well as physical technology, let me speak briefly about political technology. You'll be pleased to know that the time I spent in Russia, which is coming up to six years, uh, uh, has been put to good use. Uh, as I'm out of the way of home politics, I enjoy the privilege of letting my mind wander. The Russians often refer to political technologies in their public discourse. This is interpreted in the West as a euphemism for political manipulation. And so this may or may not be the case. 
Uh, but it did prompt me to think of political systems as intentional systems, by which I mean systems that are intended to produce certain outcomes. So rather than dividing the world up into those that are democratic and those that are authoritarian, I began to see political system more in terms of the outcomes that they were likely, or in some cases, guaranteed to produce. So one interpretation of the demonstrations in Tahrir Square in 2011 is that the pro protesters were demanding political change, the fall of Mubarak, democratic elections, the victory of youth over age. Another view of the events says that people were demanding, firstly, social justice, secondly, an end to corruption, and thirdly, jobs. So what they got was the Muslim Brotherhood. I was puzzled by the enthusiasm that the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood demonstrated in the pursuit of political power. I simply couldn't understand what they wanted to do with political, political power in case they won. As we all know, they already had tremendous social and cultural power through their compelling, their reductive, uh, and vague narrative that Islam is the answer to any problem. They also had this uh, wide social network and, and they took care of uh, many, many poor people, which obviously helped them in the elections. In order to better understand this matter, I looked at the election platform of uh, Mursi, a candidate Mursi at the time, and compared his platform to those of other parties. So my reading of the Muslim Brotherhood's agenda was the following. They wanted to correct the moral state of the Egyptian people first, and then that of others later. They wanted to enforce Sharia law, they wanted to root out corruption, and they wanted to ensure social justice, however vaguely defined. Uh, I spent um, a number of hours uh, trying to track down a sp uh, specifically a, a definition of social justice, and I couldn't find it in Arabic or in English, to be honest. So how did they propose to achieve all of these aims? The moral state of the Egyptian people and others was to be corrected with personal piety. Sharia law was to be enforced by a pious parliament. Corruption was to be eradicated by the piety of government administrators. And social justice was to be the outcome of overall and generalized piety. This is not a caricature of their approach. It is the legacy of years of insisting that Islam is the answer without delving into how and why piety, Sharia law, prayer, devotion, and the range of religious exercises that are actually central to our lives as Muslims, how this was going to translate into admin administrative and economic uh, excellence. Moral excellence, perhaps, but in a state of failed economics and disastrous public services. So in conclusion, piety and holiness are key to our lives as Muslims, but they are not systems or technologies of governance. Having spoken about these five themes that I believe must be emphasized in the fight against radical Islamism, I'd like to say something uh, about my own country and its political system. I'm slightly biased in this matter. With the events of the Arab Spring and the loud calls for immediate democratization or Islamization, many of us in the UAE asked ourselves the following question. Did it make sense to risk or sacrifice what we have achieved up until now for an idealized democratic polity or for an Islamist state, either of which could unleash destructive forces that we know are within us? So why do I say this? For two primary reasons. Firstly, in establishing the Emirates, our leadership overcame divisions and antagonisms that were deeply rooted in tribal nomadic culture. These features of our society, uh, and this is being very honest, are never too far from the surface. This is a feature common to all Arab societies. The fact that we managed to overcome these obstacles of distrust and competition for limited resources and build uh, an economic success in our region is to be commended. Once upon a time, we in the Emirates could have been like Libya today, a war zone of militias and Islamists and smugglers and terrorists. But we in the UAE are the product of a judicious understanding of what we have within our historical tribal selves and what we could become. Changing our system by a radical reordering of existing relationships is highly likely to lead to people falling back on traditional allegiances of family, tribe, and blood to the detriment of the social cohesion that we have today. We also know what happened in, in country after country in the Arab world. Extremists are better at grabbing power than moderates. Moderates take an accommodating system for granted. Rather than being radical and revolutionary, our approach has been to uncover our own potential and to reveal to ourselves what is already present. I'll go further and propose that key features of the UAE system can form the basis of positive development in other parts of the Arab world. Why? Let me return to the five themes which I began this talk with. Morality, tolerance, moderation, inclusivity, and technology. First, I'd say that in contrast to the Islamist relentless and often hypocritical focus on moral virtue, we in the UAE recognize human weakness. Though we set high standards for, standards for ourselves, we recognize that perfection is an attribute of Allah and not of people. 
there is a remarkable readiness to forgive errors and move on. This translates into the rise of the entrepreneurial class amongst Emirati youth, as well as a lenient, or at least a more lenient, approach to other people's moral conduct. We believe these matters are a choice for the individual. We do not engage in moral witch hunts. Secondly, I'd like to say that the UAE's rulers are decidedly tolerant Muslims, and certainly not Islamists. The Islamist ass assumes that he is right and that you are wrong. The president and founder of the UAE, His Highness Sheikh Zayed, God rest his soul, made clear his opposition to movements like ISIS. My quote, in these times we see around us violent men who claim to talk on behalf of Islam. These people have nothing whatsoever that connects them to Islam, they are apostates and criminals. He also interestingly rejected the Muslim Brotherhood's agenda. Uh, he met with the Brotherhood's leaders in the 1970s and refused their proposal to set up an office in the capital, Abu Dhabi. When asked why, he responded, if you are the Muslim Brothers, then who are we? In our approach, all are included, as long as they include others. This key feature translates into the allied notion of tolerance. <laughs> If we are prone to error and we do not exclude those who are different, this expresses itself as a deep tolerance and acceptance of other ethnicities and other faiths. We have over 190 nationalities in the UAE and, and over 70 churches, I'm told. Mosques are full and churches are full. Thirdly, the UAE takes action to suppress religious hatred and extremism by maintaining rigorous control on the content of clergy's <laughs> sermons. Having uh, been a frequent attendant, uh, uh, attender of, of uh, Friday prayers, I understand why they uh, control the clergy sermon so well. It also hosts the International Center of Excellence Against Violent Extremism in, in Abu Dhabi. The center is engaged in capacity building and best practice exchanges, encountering all forms of violent extremism. In order to further promote peace in Muslim communities, the UAE announced uh, in, 20, uh, in July of 2014 the establishment of the Muslim Council of Elders. Uh, an independent international body of scholars from Muslim countries, promoting the core tolerant values and practices of our faith. Fourthly, <clears throat> our system is both consensus and leadership driven. The UAE does have some explicitly democratic mechanism, allowing for formal voting and voicing of opinion. However, more significantly, the UAE has social and cultural mechanisms and platforms for debate, analysis, polling, idea testing, and consensus building. These are not immediately uh, visible to the outsider and even sometimes the insider. Uh, however, they are there and they do exist and they are effective. Going forward, there will inevitably be a need to further develop and refine these indigenous systems of signaling. Uh, and that will be done and done by us. Consensus is allied with leadership. Historically, the leaders of the tribes of the region were men who had proven themselves by natural leadership abilities. It's the combination of commu uh, communal uh, consensus and strong decisive leadership that uh, move us forward as a society. As a society, we face the uncertainty of the future, not as a source of anxiety and an excuse for autocracy, but rather as a challenge and with determination. Fifthly, we're not afraid of technology. We focus on getting things done in a manner that can be measured in the welfare of our people. This means that we focus on technological innovations, and, and this will sound strange, but I, uh, I, I do think of it as a technological innovation. The rule of law, to begin with, uh, efficient judicial systems, administrative effectiveness, which is something that is uh, focused on to an, an extreme uh, level, uh, schools, and a variety of schools and diversity in the, uh, in the, uh, in the provision of schools, uh, functioning an adequate health system, I think we can probably improve there, Airlines that connect us with the world and show us how dependent we are on the rest of the world. Government as a platform provider and an economy that is open to outside investment and is freeing itself from dependence on oil. These are some of the key features that explain the success of the UAE over the last 40 years. The first, steps, the first step involves leadership with a vision for what is possible. And the second step is the vital work of building and reinforcing trust between key members of society. This work of trust building cannot be underestimated. And, and to be honest, when I look around at the uh, other countries of the Middle East, uh, I can only interpret what's going on as a lack of trust between different communities. And I often think how we need to think of uh, ways in which we managed in the uh, late 60s and early 70s to build trust between the differing groups of the Emirates and perhaps share that experience with uh, some of our neighbors. So we want our fellow, uh, this, so this work of, of trust building can't be underestimated, as I said. We want our fellow Arabs to engage in the st same step-by-step -step approach that we have followed, always reaffirming and demonstrating goodwill to each other. 
So in conclusion, uh, I tentatively put forward the idea that we in the Arab world are pursued by a variety of fundamentalisms, by rigid ideas and preconceived notions of what people are like and of what the outcomes should be. And it is these dogmas that distract us from building our societies today, uh, as well as tempt us with the possibility or the seeming possibility of instantaneous utopias that may, we may want but need to work towards. ISIS is the proof we all needed in Sunni Islam to recognize that there are and must be different interpretations and that laymen of goodwill uh, are obliged to enter the fray. Laymen and women need to wrestle back Islam from the embrace of violence. ISIS makes a mockery of all the values that we believe and know Islam to embrace. So if there are three thoughts that I'd like to leave you with today. Number one, we in the United Arab Emirates believe wholeheartedly that the Arab world has the capacity and the knowledge to create a path of intellectual and economic productivity. Uh, and that violence is the least effective means of achieving what the silent majority wants. An Arab world that is at peace with itself and confident in its position in the community of nations. Number two, most young Arabs prefer the Emirates model to that of the Islamists. The 2014 Arab Youth Survey showed, not for the first time, that when asked what country their countries should emulate, Arab youth named the UAE above all other countries, above the US, above the UK, above Turkey and Iran. Thirdly, I'd like to say that we Muslims and the Muslim communities of the Arab world in particular have within us the capacity to reformulate our approach to ourselves, firstly, and then to the rest of the world and thereby to share the beauty of our great religion with all. And in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for having given me this opportunity to speak to you today. <laughs>